How about this? The world's got a problem. A billion people around, a billion of our fellow human beings are hungry. Nearly half of them live in, ocean, in fishery producing nations. And there are 750 million people living in poverty in those fishing producing nations. Now, think about what we're about to head into. By the middle of this century, human beings will be at 9 billion, up from about 7 billion right now, plus or minus a billion, depending on the estimates. Feeding that growth is a challenge. That's a 34% increase in the number of people from where we are now. Factor in increases in standard of living, devoutly to be hoped for, because there are poor people, and you have an enormous increase in the demand for food staring at us by the year 2050. Experts, even th common person just thinking for a moment about that challenge have to be worried. Think about where we already stand. Arable land per, per capita has already been in decline, as this data shows, for 50 years. And we're headed into climate change. This map shows you the impacts on the world, the changes in rainfall in brown areas less, in blue areas more, hitting the breadbaskets of the world. The Midwest, about to head for drought. The, the central part of Europe, about to head for drought. Now, if you were going to deal with this situation and feed people by the middle of the century, you would want the oceans to be abundant. You would want the oceans to be feeding as many people as, we, as they can. And in fact, over history, what have the oceans done for us? This is what they've done. As far back in time as you can see from here, the global catch in wild fish has grown. This shows you 1970 till now, but if you, as far back as the data lets us see, that's the trend until the late 1980s when this happened. We are now on the downslope. This shows you the total catch in just pounds of the wild fish caught in the world. And despite enormous efforts, we're on the downslope. You've heard of peak oil. This is peak fish. That's a problem. How are we going to fix that? Now, here's some good news. The most productive parts of the ocean, which would be the ones you would want to focus on if you wanted to turn this around, are shown in this map. The most productive parts of the ocean are the shallower parts, the coastal parts shown here in pink and yellow and green. But why is that good news? The coastal parts of the ocean our national territory, as shown in this map. The coastal nations of the world took control of their oceans out to 200 nautical miles. That means that they are managed by nation states, not by international treaties and the United Nations like the high seas are, shown in this map. Why is that good news? It's a practical fact of the way the modern world works that nation states, many of them, not all, can get things done much better than international bodies can. So we have some good news here. The fish are, we hope, smart enough to live their lives in the coastal zones. Let's see if that's the facts. Where are the fish? That's what this slide is going to show us. Guess what? The fish are where we need them to be, by a factor of seven to one. This shows you the annual catch in metric tons of the world's wild fish catch from the coastal zones, called EEZs, exclusive economic zones, compared to the international zones, the high seas. Very good start. Now you're saying, but wait a minute. There are a lot of coastal countries, Andy. There are over 100 coastal countries, and if the fish are spread evenly all around those, we have a dreadfully complicated task. So let's find out. If we make a list 
of the world's countries, where the ones that have the biggest catch are at the top of the list in order, let's ask the question, how much of the world's fish catch can 10 countries manage? How much of the world's fish catch can 10 countries doing a good job deliver to us? The answer is 53%. Of the world's wild fish are in the exclusive economic zones of just 10 countries. How many of the world's wild fish are in the top 25 countries? 75%. Very, very good news. We now have a project that practical people can get their arms around. 10 to 25 countries have it within their capacity to manage their fisheries so that they can be abundant and feed lots of people. Now, what do we need them to do? We need them to manage their commercial fleets so that they don't overfish. It's real simple. And that comes down to three things. Enforce scientific quotas, protect nursery habitat, and minimize bycatch. That's the accidental killing of non-target species. You do these three things in 10 to 25 countries around the world, and you will see more fish in the water and more people being fed. Now, at this point, some people say, wait a minute. What about fish farming? Why don't we dispense with this task of managing the fisheries and just farm our way to feed people with fish farming? Now, here's the basic facts about fish farming. Most fish farming is of creatures like these, salmon and tuna. What do they eat? They eat fish. The fish that they get fed by the fish farmers are wild fish that are caught, ground up into little pellets and fed to the fish in the, pen, in the pens. And in the process, you convert at a minimum four pounds of wild fish into one pound of farm fish. It's a reduction fishery. It's a negative direction activity. You could also farm fish that f eat soybeans. That's a more useful activity. That does require land and water and other, and other things that are in short supply. And, not, and it's helpful, but not as good as wild fish. Now, do we know that this will work just in theory, or do we know this in fact? Let's look at some actual history. This is 1965 to current, the U.S. haddock fishery. Here's what happens. It gets crashed by overfishing. Finally, the United States in 1994 gets around to putting catch limits on this fishery. Guess what happens? Comes back. Let's look again. Here's the Norwegian herring fishery, 1950 till now. What happens? It gets punished, it gets crashed, overfishing. The Norwegians get around to putting fish limits. What happens? Comes back. Here we have the Norwegian Arctic cod. You'll all know the case of the Canadian cod. These are the cod that are on the other side of the Atlantic, the Eastern Atlantic cod. They get punished. What happens when discard limits are imposed? It comes back. Over and over again, the basic facts of what you need to do to produce an abundant ocean have been proven by in the places where governments have taken these simple steps, quotas, habitat, and bycatch. You get the fish back. You get them back in five or 10 years. This is not some academic abstraction. So what does it mean if you do this on a global scale? This is the data we saw a moment ago. This is the world's catch in tonnage of all of the commercial fleets in the world. It peaks in 1988, it starts to come down. If we could get the top 10 to 25 countries in the world to do the right thing, here's what we could see. We could see by the middle of the century an increase in sustainable forever ocean fishing up to 100 million metric tons a year. What does that deliver? We are on a trajectory right now to be able to feed the ocean, to feed the people, the hungry people of the world, 450 million meals a day from wild seafood. If we turn that around, that number can grow to 700 million people every day having a seafood meal. And then if we did something that it would be even more difficult but even more morally correct, 
we would stop reduction fisheries like salmon farms and you'd feed 1.1 billion people a day, a seafood meal. This is a practical part of both producing an abundant ocean and feeding the people who live on this planet. You would do this because it's necessary. You would also do it because, guess what? It's the most cost-effective animal protein we've got. This chart shows you the metric tons per $100,000 of wild fish on the left compared to aquaculture, poultry, pork, beef, and lamb. So just from a business point of view, you want to do this. It's also the best in terms of usage of land, another scarce resource. Need I point out that wild fish don't require land. They also use very little fresh water, another very limited resource. You use a little bit to process them, but you don't have to irrigate a field full of grain in order to feed the cows. They also use, produce very little CO2. Livestock production is a contributor to global warming. Wild fish, you have to burn some diesel to get the fleet out there, but very little CO2. And it's already, this shows how much wild fish is of the current animal protein diet of the world. It's already, at this level, we can make it bigger. And guess what? It's healthy. Over and over again, people tell us that if you shift from red meat to fish, you get substantial benefits in heart disease, obesity, and cancer. Fish. Wild fish is the perfect protein. Now, there's an interesting thing about the way the world approaches problems. There's a kind of inertia in the system. Conservation organizations started paying attention to the oceans, and conservationists started paying attention to the oceans in a serious way about 30, 35 years ago, first time it really happened in human history. And there were habits of mind built up from terrestrial conservation. And on the land, agriculture is at war with biodiversity. You cut down the biodiverse place, the forest, to plant the food production place, the cornfield. And in, because it's a war, people pretty much have to choose a side. And they're both morally significant activities, protecting biodiversity and feeding people. So when, ocean, when philanthropists went and, and conservationists went into the ocean, they tended to carry that habit. And they focused on the most biodiverse places, the places shown on the top two quadrants of this two by two matrix. Well, in the ocean, an interesting thing is true. The most biodiverse places tend to be tropical, reefy places. The most productive places tend to be cold, temperate places. So as a result, the conservation community focused on the biodiverse places and really didn't pay that much attention to the most productive places. And this is shown in a recent study where there's nearly five, six times more investment per ton of fish in the biodiverse fish than there is in the productive fish. So there's an opportunity. It's also interesting that in the ocean, the war that we see on land between agriculture and biodiversity is, is not happening. In the ocean, the things that you do to promote abundance, the things that you do to promote biodiversity also promote abundance. These two goals are in alliance with each other in the ocean. The very same things that protect biodiversity allow us to feed people. You don't have to make a choice about what you do. You just have to make a choice about where you do it. So the opportunity is to get this done in these 10 to 25 countries. Oceana does this by national policy making on, guess what, quotas, habitat, and bycatch. We establish a team of people, and we go after a decision maker who can get that done, and we convince them and push them and prod them. Guess what? Do quotas, habitat, and bycatch. Does this work? We've been doing this for 10 years. 
We have 50 important policy victories symbolized by the photographs on this page. Three examples. We set the goal in the United States of stopping the bycatch of salmon in the Pollock fleet, which was clobbering salmon in the process of catching Pollock. We got that done. There are now, for the first time, hard limits on that activity. In another victory in Belize, the, a, a Central American country, we set the goal of protecting it from bottom trawling. This is a form of fishing where you drag a heavily weighted net along the bottom and destroy the habitat in the process. We got that done. Belize has now completely banned trawling in all of its national waters. The third example, in, um, in uh, I'm trying to remember where the third example is. Yes, third example is in Chile, the largest fishery by weight there is called the Jack Mackerel, Jack Mackerel Fishery. It's for year over year over year been catching more than the scientists said they should. We got them this year to establish for the first time quotas consistent with the scientific recommendation and that fish will, fishery will recover. So this will work. We can do this in 10 to 25 countries. We can put the recovery of ocean abundance onto a trajectory in line with the population growth. This is a map a chart showing 1990 to 2050, and the yellow line shows you population. The dotted line shows your fisheries. We can feed millions of people with a protein that is healthier, uses very little land, none in fact, water saving, less polluting, and extremely cost effective. We can make sure that 700 million people a day get a healthy seafood meal. Thank you very much.